Good afternoon. Uh, this is CIVE 634, uh, Surface Water Hydrology, and today is um, August 29th, uh, 2022, and I'm Professor Victor Pons from San Diego State University, and the lecture today would be on basic principles of surface water hydrology. Okay, does everybody see the, the page, the site, the course yeah. site? Yeah, we see it. Okay, so then uh, we are going to go to the syllabus. And at this point, uh, I am going to be briefly, briefly talking about, we're at A11, now A12 is the next one. A conceptual model of catchment water balance, formulation and calibration. And the second one is a conceptual model of catchment water balance, application to runoff and base flow modeling. This is a corollary of the first one. These two papers were published in the journal Hydrology. That's a, that's a European journal in 1995. Um, I'm not going to stress too much on these papers, other than the fact that uh, they are uh, reiteration in more detail on the paper on Livovich that we have already covered. Uh, however, I I am going to say something important. Let me. Let me get in there and get in there. Uh, so as you can see, this relates back to the work by uh, Livovich. I wrote this paper in 1995 with Mr. Shady, which was one of our contributors from India, or collaborators from India. Uh, okay, what we did in here is interesting. When I, I told you, I think I mentioned to you, when I was in India in 1992, I ran into Livovich's paper and I was very much appreciative that I was there at the library of the National Institute of Hydrology and ran into Livovich's uh, book. Um, I believe the Livovich book was here already at the library, but you know how it is. Sometimes you hit the lock or so, whatever. But the point is that I had not seen Livovich prior to my travel to India in 1992. So uh, we found out that Livovich had uh, done uh, studies on the relationship between, let me see over here. Yeah, the relationship between the variables, which is the uh, rainfall and the annual runoff, which here I'm representing X and Y, rainfall and annual runoff. Now, the difference between, there was a lot of similarity between what Levovich was doing and the method, the runoff curve number method and uh, of the U.S. Uh, Vic Marcus developed the runoff curve number method in the year 1954. But the difference was that the runoff curve number method was applied to the event situation because that's what the Soil Conservation Service at the time wanted to do. Livovich, on the other hand, was concerned about, about the yield. That means the annual uh, relationship between the rainfall and the runoff. Uh, but it so happened that I saw that there were a lot of similarities because basically Livovich, without really stating it, he was using this kind of the same equation that Marcus had used in 1954. And that's, this is basically this equation. And what this equation says in no uncertain terms is that the runoff is going to go up and then hit a parallel to the 45 degree angle. And that's a concept that Marcus developed, like I said, for the Soil Conservation Service in 1954. But apparently this was something that, that Livovich was also considering, but for the yield situation, the annual situation. So I thought that uh, it would be interesting to develop uh, furthermore the theory of Livovich for the yield and apply the method that SES had already developed. So these are the equations that SES put together and leads to this one. Uh, the variables have changed because I was talking about yield in here as opposed to if event. But we finally got to basically the same thing. We calibrated the model. We used a specific way of calibrating the model. Uh, and um, we basically came up with the data or studied in extens extensively the data that Livovich had put together and here we were concerned about developing these two coefficients, the initial abstraction coefficient, which we call gamma sub s, and the wetting potential w sub p. 
And we calibrated based on the data of Libovich, and we found these charts in here. These are the charts that we found. As you can see, for the various conditions that we had in here. So basically, this paper was a success in the sense that we had put together the Libovich theory with the Marcus approach to the uh, to the curve uh, to the curve number, the the curve number Marcus's approach. So there was a success, and we published this paper. And uh, subsequently, or rather, right after we published this paper, we uh, decided to uh, let me see if I can get over here. We decided to do a corollary, and this was this paper, a corollary application to runoff and base flow modeling. <coughs> so this is more of the same, extending it and taking this concept a little further, and we developed this this concept of, um, as you can see, we have the same concepts of Libovich here, runoff coefficient, base flow coefficient, but we then decided to do a what we call the runoff and base flow gains uh, because we were really interested in studying the, the mathematical behavior of these curves that we have in here. So we found the runoff and base flow gains. Now, I don't research the literature, you know, last 15, 20 years, but I believe that these uh, concepts have yet to get a, a, a hold in, in the hydrology that is practiced. Nevertheless, they are interesting concepts. So what I want you to do is to review these papers lightly. Don't, don't thread too much into them because I probably am not going to query you a whole lot because I believe that this is perhaps a little more than what it's necessary for you to uh, achieve or ac accomplish at this point. So these are the two problems or the two papers rather that I wrote, wrote with Mr. Shetty in 1995. A, pa a third paper that I have now for you, or another paper, is the Penman paper. Now, who is Mr. Penman? Penman was a British gentleman who was very famous, became very famous around the world because of his studies in evaporation and evapotranspiration. It was needed at the time he was doing this. This is in the 40s, late 40s. And um, in 1970, when uh, the environmental movement took off, I believe it was April 22nd, 1970, I believe if I'm correct, Earth Day, the first Earth Day. And after that, uh, the uh, Scientific American, which is a, an American magazine of science, commissioned a whole bunch of scientists, very important people, well recognized, to do a series of paper papers on the environment. And they gave Penman the authorization to write one on the water part of the environment. And this led to this paper, which is called The Water Cycle by Penman. I believe his name is Harold. Harold Penman, uh, published in Scientific America 1970. So I am going, I want you to read this paper for what it's worth, it's Mr. Penman. After all, Penman is, is one of the greatest hydrologists of all time. Uh, obviously, by this time, he's deceased. Uh, so I want you to read this paper carefully. Um, he, has a, he, has, he has a lot of important things in there. Maybe there's one or two misconceptions, but no big deal. All papers that are in the forefront have a few misconceptions. We have examined that already. But that's okay. No problem. We can read that. So in order in here to view, and I'm just going to, like I said, I'm not going to go over with you in detail, but I do want you to read this paper because it is a, a milestone paper written by a gentleman that at the time he really knew he was ahead of, of the game, if you could call it a game. So this is Mr. Penman. He tells us that, that there is 1.5 billion cubic kilometers of water in one form, form or another. There's a whole lot of water. 69% of the Earth's surface is covered by water. And we know from, from morphology of the ocean that the deepest part of the ocean is about two and a half times deeper than the height of Mount Everest in, in Nepal. So there's a lot of water out there. And it has been calculated or estimated, as, as um, Penman says in, in this paper. He talks about the properties of water. 
He's making a point that water is extremely peculiar, and that is why it may have been chosen by nature to uh, to serve as the uh, the helper of the for the development of life. Okay, then he talks about uh, the various properties, and I am not going to stress too much on this here because we are going to later on extensively talk about that. He talks about the the whole moment, which is a fundamental concept of the molecule of water, which allows it to pick up stuff. Water is always picking up stuff, and that's the reason why it's heavily involved with the nature of life because the elements and the, the molecules need to be moved around. And water is the instrument that moves them around all over the place. Okay, and the various other properties uh, of, uh, of uh, that, okay, we're over here now. We're over here. Uh, like I said, I'm not gonna go too much. He talks about the pH, he talks about, um, the um, the various again uh, various other properties and he does get into the issue of physics versus chemistry versus biology which is the main message that we are going to be making in a few minutes here there is no nature doesn't really distinguish readily between all three of those sciences at the beginning when science started to develop back two two and a half centuries ago like physics, mechanics came early with Newton, then it was Lavoisier from France and others, but it hasn't been more than 300 years that science developed in earnest. And at the time, of course, we had to, for ease of understanding, you know, the human mind is limited in size. We had to divide and we divided into physics, chemistry and biology. But nature does not understand or cannot see the separation between them. As a matter of fact, it's only one thing, it's nature, as, as we will endeavor to show later on. Okay, so that is basically the paper by, by uh, uh, Benman that we will later talk about in more detail. Now, I have a, a, a paper here which kind of parallels the work of Penman, but in more detail, in more intuitively, like for, in, for, the, for the case of teaching because that's what we want to do. We want to be able to, you guys, that you guys pick up these concepts readily. So we have a paper called The Properties of Water, which will I'll endeavor to get in here later on. But what I want to do is, because we already have it, is the video. So I'm going to show you the video. It's a 30-minute video. So sit down and carefully, we're going to watch this entire video. And then after that, I will go from the raster to the vector, as I said earlier. So. Let me start here with the video. Water is the quintessential compound of nature. It plays an important role in a host of physical, chemical, and biological processes. At the same time, its quantity and quality including its spatial and temporal distribution, pointedly. Everything is okay, right? Yeah, it looks good. All instances of human endeavor. The study of water continues to engage professionals in a variety of fields, including engineering, physics, chemistry, biology, geology, geography, sociology, and the law, to name some of the most important. Accordingly, it is an absolute necessity for learned professionals to understand water and its properties so that its stewardship and management may be accomplished in a rational way. The structure of the water molecule appears simple enough, but a complete characterization continues to defy scientists. A systematic study of water in molecular form and in the aggregate is much needed to throw additional light onto its capabilities and uses and to understand why it is the chemical compound chosen by nature to condition and sustain life. Salient properties of water are the following. Its capacity for ambient temperature regulation, its floatability in solid state, ice, 
its surface tension and capillarity properties, its marked solvent property, and its active relation with proton and electron chemistry. <coughs> Here, we endeavor to explore the properties of water with the objective of improving its management. The French chemist Antoine Lavoisier discovered that water is composed of two elements, oxygen and hydrogen. He recognized the name oxygen in 1778 and hydrogen in 1783. He gave hydrogen its name to mean generator of water. In 1804, another French chemist, Joseph Gay Lussac, together with the German naturalist Alexander von Humboldt, showed that the water molecule consists of two atoms of hydrogen for each atom of oxygen to form the ubiquitous chemical formula H2O. The atoms of water are held together by sharing their electrons, the negatively charged subatomic particles that surround the positively charged nucleus. The nucleus of each atom of hydrogen, the smallest element in nature, contains one proton and one neutron, and it is orbited by one electron in a single layer that can admit a maximum of two. Thus, an atom of hydrogen can take one more electron in its single layer, which participates in the sharing of electrons with another hydrogen atom to form the hydrogen molecule, H2. An atom of oxygen has eight protons and eight neutrons in its nucleus, and eight electrons orbiting it, two of which are located in the full inner layer and the other six in an incomplete outer layer which can take up to eight electrons. Thus, an atom of oxygen can take two more electrons in its outer layer, which participates in the sharing of electrons with another oxygen atom to form the oxygen molecule, O2. The pairs of shared electrons form covalent bonds, which provide the strongest attraction between atoms constituting very stable molecules. To form a water molecule, H2O, one oxygen atom joins two hydrogen atoms, proceeding to share their electrons. Each one of the two hydrogen atoms shares its lone electron with the oxygen atom in its outer layer to fill in the two empty spaces, thus completing the layer to eight electrons while forming two covalent bonds. In this way, each hydrogen atom is full with two electrons in its single layer, and each oxygen atom is full with eight electrons in its outer layer. The two strong covalent bonds keep the molecule together. A molecule of water has two pairs of shared electrons, that is, two simple covalent bonds. Note that the angle between the OH bonds it's not 180 degrees or 90 degrees. It should be the case if the spatial distribution were planar, that is, two-dimensional. Rather, the water molecule has a three-dimensional structure with its components arranged following a tetrahedral molecular geometry. If the tetrahedron were a regular one, the angle between the bonds would be 109.5 degrees. However, the tetrahedron of the water molecule is not regular. The oxygen atom occupies the center of the tetrahedron, and the two hydrogen atoms occupy each of two vertices, with the remaining two vertices housing the two pairs of oxygen electrons that are not part of the covalent bonds, constituting two electron clouds. This three-dimensional configuration results in a slightly irregular tetrahedron with an angle of 104.5 degrees between the two covalent bonds linking the oxygen atom and the two hydrogen atoms.
range in which water is in liquid state is ideal for the various life forms that are present on Earth. However, when it is compared with similar compounds, water should boil at a temperature lower than minus 59 degrees Celsius, not at 100 degrees Celsius. This table contains the values of molar mass and boiling point for several compounds labeled H2X, where X stands for elements located in the same column as oxygen in the periodic table of the elements. The molar mass M in grams per mole is defined as the mass in grams of a given substance divided by its amount in moles. Since water has the lowest molar mass among these compounds, the expectation is that it would have the lowest boiling point, not the highest. The apparent anomaly can be explained by the bond between water molecules, or hydrogen bond. In a water molecule, the oxygen nucleus with eight positive charges attracts electrons better than the hydrogen nucleus with one positive charge. Hence, the oxygen atom is partially negatively charged and the hydrogen atom is partially positively charged. The hydrogen atoms are not only strongly attached to the oxygen atoms by covalent bonds, but also weakly attracted to other nearby oxygen atoms by hydrogen bonds. Each water molecule can donate up to two hydrogens and accept other two in a tetrahedral structure. The hydrogen bond is a weak bond with a very short lifetime. The broken hydrogen bond, however, often simply reforms, being broken for very short periods of time, less than a hundred femtoseconds. In solid state, that is ice, all water molecules participate in four hydrogen bonds, two as donor and two as acceptor, and are held in relatively static state. In liquid state, some of the weaker hydrogen bonds break to allow the molecules to move around. This continues to happen with an increase in temperature up to the boiling point. The large amount of energy required to break these bonds must be supplied during the melting and boiling processes. The molecules of hydrogen telluride, hydrogen selenide, and hydrogen sulfide exhibit dipole to dipole intermolecular forces, which are attractive forces between the positive end of one polar molecule and the negative end of another, forming a bond which is weaker than a hydrogen bond. In summary, a hydrogen bond increases the intermolecular cohesion, which prevents water molecules from being easily released from the water surface. Consequently, the vapor pressure is reduced. As the boiling point cannot occur until the vapor pressure equals the external pressure, a higher temperature is required. The boiling point of water is a function of ambient pressure. For instance, at the peak of Mount Everest, at an elevation of 8,848 meters, water boils at 70 degrees Celsius, while in the deep sea, it remains liquid above 300 degrees Celsius. To understand this behavior, we must examine the relation between temperature and pressure. The mobility of a water molecule increases with temperature and decreases with pressure. At high altitude, the atmospheric pressure is lower, resulting in more mobility. For this reason, the temperature necessary to reach the boiling point is lower. This figure shows a phase diagram illustrating the preferred physical states of water at different ranges of temperature and pressure. At TP, or triple point, the three stable phases, solid, liquid, and gaseous, may coexist at equilibrium. On the other hand, at CP, or critical point, the properties of liquid and gaseous phases become indistinguishable from each other. Under sufficiently high temperature and pressure, liquid water is hot enough and gaseous water is under enough pressure for their densities to be equal. 
The change of water from liquid to gaseous phase occurs with energy absorption. Two measures describe the change. One, the specific heat capacity, and two, the heat of vaporization. The specific heat capacity is the amount of energy per unit mass of water required to raise its temperature by one degree Celsius. The heat of vaporization is the amount of energy required to convert one gram of water from liquid to gaseous state at constant temperature. Water has the highest specific heat capacity of all liquids except ammonia because a great amount of energy is required to break the hydrogen bonds. Since the energy absorbed in this process is not available to increase the water's kinetic energy, it takes a greater quantity of heat to raise the temperature of water. In addition, it takes a great amount of energy to change water from liquid to gaseous state because of the energy required to break the hydrogen bonds. Consequently, water has the highest heat of vaporization of any liquid and hence a very low volatility. This property of water is important for regional climate regulation, explaining the marked difference between hyperoceanic and inland continental climates. For instance, the state of North Dakota with an inland continental climate is subject to more temperature variability between winter and summer than the entire U.S. average, which is influenced by hyperoceanic climates. The density of water varies with temperature within a very narrow range. Typically, liquid substances shrink with a decrease in temperature, thereby increasing their densities. However, liquid water presents a unique behavior, contracting with temperature reduction until the temperature reaches 4 degrees Celsius. At this point, water reaches the maximum density of 1 gram per cubic centimeter, after which it begins to expand, decreasing its density and allowing its solid form, that is ice, to float. The higher density of 4 degrees Celsius may be explained by analyzing ice structure. The H2O molecules form an hexagonal grid of tetrahedral geometry. This configuration assures that ice molecules are less compacted than water molecules, occupying a greater volume. Thus, the cooling to 4 degrees Celsius results in the expansion of the space between water molecules, decreasing its density. In nature, the change in water density with temperature at or near 4 degrees Celsius is responsible for the thermal stratification of the water column. In the absence of mixing, at 4 degrees Celsius, the top layer will cool to the freezing point and ice will form on the surface. This ice layer will block the exchange of energy between the cold air above and the warm water below. Therefore, the ambient cooling continues, but with no drop of temperature in the water column below. The formation of an ice layer on the surface of the water body discourages the freezing of the water column. Therefore, it makes possible the survival of aquatic plants and animals in lakes and seas. <coughs> Due to high cohesive forces, water molecules at the surface are more attracted to the molecules within the liquid than they are to molecules of air outside of it, producing surface tension at the gaseous liquid interface. In contrast, molecules of water inside the liquid are equally attracted in all directions. This property makes it more difficult to move an object through the surface than to move it when it is completely submerged. That is why insects, which are heavier than water, can float and slide on a water surface. The movement of water up or down capillary tubes is due to surface tension. Capillary action occurs when the adhesion of water molecules to the walls is stronger than the cohesive forces between the liquid molecules. The meniscus is the curved liquid gaseous surface interface. 
It is concave when the liquid molecules are strongly attracted due to adhesion to the walls of the container, as in the case of water. Conversely, the meniscus is convex when the liquid molecules have a stronger attraction to each other due to cohesion than to the wall of the container, as with mercury. Capillary action makes it possible for plants to thrive. Capillarity allows subsurface water to move up into the root zone, but only up to a small distance, after which it cannot overcome gravity. Due to strong cohesion forces, the water molecules that evaporate on the leaf surface attract others in the neighborhood, helping the water to get up the plant, eventually reaching all branches. Within the soil profile, the capillary height is 2 to 5 centimeters in coarse sand, increasing as the soil particle diameter decreases, reaching more than 3 to 4 meters in some cases. The water molecule has the property of polarity, featuring a relatively large dipole moment. The dipole moment arises because oxygen is more negatively charged than hydrogen. Thus, oxygen pulls in the shared electrons, increasing the electron density around itself. The dipole moment of water is mu equal 1.85 d, where d stands for Debye, with d equal to 10 to the minus 18 stat coulomb centimeter. The polarity of water is important for many of its properties, including the ability to dissolve solutes, melting and boiling points, specific heat, surface tension, and general reactivity. Water can dissolve almost anything, and therefore it is regarded as the universal solvent. Water's large dipole moment is associated with its relatively high dielectric constant. Coulomb's law, named after the French physicist Charles de Coulomb, states that the force F between two charged particles is inversely proportional to the medium's dielectric constant K. That is, the greater the K, the lesser the force F. In a vacuum, K is equal to 1. For water, K is equal to 78.5. This large value of K derived from the water molecule's polarity makes it possible for the substances formed by the association of two charged components to disassociate readily in water and that all polar substances see their attraction and repulsion forces diminished. Moreover, the presence of dissolved ions in water results in a marked increase in its electrical conductivity. Otherwise, water would behave essentially is a non-conductive medium because of its patent lack of native ions in its pure state. In salt water, electricity is conducted by ions. Sodium ions absorb electrons from the negative terminal, passing them to chlorine ions and then to the positive terminal, forming a bridge which conducts electrical current. The still water has a very low electrical conductivity of 0.000055 decisiemens per meter. Portable water is around 0.1 to 0.5 decisiemens per meter, and seawater about 44 decisiemens per meter. Therefore, the greater the salinity of the water, that is, the greater the concentration of ions in the solution, the greater its electrical conductivity. Life, which is based on carbon chemistry, requires a liquid medium to develop effectively. Water in its liquid state is the best medium for that chemistry. Water is required for the dissolution of chemical compounds that sustain life and for the transport of nutrients and wastes. These compounds include salts, sugars, acids, bases, and gases such as oxygen and carbon dioxide. In addition, water associates itself to the polar regions of organic compounds such as lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. Often these compounds form hydrogen bonds with water, 
which are weak attractions between a proton in one molecule and an electronegative atom in the other. The energy driving biological processes is generally due to gradients of proton concentration in an aqueous medium on both sides of a membrane. A proton of hydrogen is an atom of hydrogen which is missing its electron. The water molecule has a weak capacity to spontaneously separate into two distinct ionic components. One, the hydronium ion, or positively charged cation, H3O positive, which is a water molecule with an attached hydrogen proton. And two, the hydroxide ion, or negatively charged anion, OH minus, which is a water molecule with a hydrogen proton missing in a reversible formula. In pure water, the concentrations of hydronium and hydroxide ions are very small and identical, each being 10 to the minus 7 moles per liter at 25 degrees Celsius. The concept of pH, or percentage of hydronium, is used to characterize the purity of water. The pH is the negative of the exponent of the concentration of hydronium ions. Thus, a pH equals 7 refers to pure or neutral water. For a higher hydronium concentration, say 10 to the minus 6 moles per liter, the water solution would be acid. Conversely, for a lower hydronium concentration, say 10 to the minus 8 moles per liter, the water molecule would be basic. The pH of water decreases sharply in a solution containing large quantities of a strong acid such as hydrochloric acid. The molecules of hydrochloric acid readily donate their protons to increase the concentration of hydronium ions, that is, decrease the pH of the solution. Likewise, the pH of water increases sharply in a solution containing large quantities of a strong base such as sodium hydroxide. The molecules of sodium hydroxide readily accept protons to decrease the concentration of hydronium ions, that is, increase the pH of the solution. All organisms have a range of pH in which their body fluids remain healthy. Values of pH too high or too low may cause damage to cells. Normal values generally tend to be close to neutral that is pH 7. This figure shows typical aqueous solutions in a pH scale. The concentration of electrons in an aqueous medium is useful in characterizing the various stages of the oxidation reduction process. For this purpose, the concept of redox potential or oxidation reduction potential, ORP, is used. Its complementarity to pH in conditioning biochemical processes is indeed remarkable. It is also referred to as E or E sub H, or alternatively expressed as a corresponding PE scale. Redox potential is a measure of the affinity of a substance to lose or gain electrons and thereby to be oxidized or reduced, respectively. The standard is hydrogen with zero redox potential, or E equals zero millivolts, in well oxidized water with dissolved oxygen concentrations above one milligram per liter, the redox potential is highly positive, about 300 to 500 millivolts and can reach up to 800 millivolts under conditions of optimum oxidation. In reduced environments where dissolved oxygen is lacking, the redox potential is small positive, approximately 100 millivolts, and may even reach negative values. Extremely reduced environments may feature a redox potential as low as minus 400 millivolts. A positive value of redox potential indicates that a substance is an oxidizing agent. The higher the reading, the more oxidizing it is. As such, a substance with a reading of 400 millivolts 
is four times more oxidizing than a substance with a reading of 100 millivolts. Conversely, a negative reading indicates that a substance is a reducing agent. The lower the reading, the more reducing it is. Thus, a substance with a reading of minus 400 millivolts is four times more reducing than a substance with a reading of minus 100 millivolts. Most types of water, including tap water and bottled water, are oxidizing agents as their value of redox potential is positive. Alkaline ionized water is a reducing agent as it has a negative value of redox potential and it is able to donate extra electrons to neutralize the harmful effects of free radicals on the organism. However, most other types of water are oxidizing agents as the redox potential is positive. In wetland ecosystems, the redox potential conditions the time sequence of various types of oxidation reduction reactions in newly flooded organic substrate, ranging from oxygen reduction a highly positive redox potential, E equal 800 millivolts, to methanogenesis at the very low negative values, E equal to minus 400 millivolts. This figure shows the decrease with time of the relative concentration of electrons in seasonally flooded soils. The physical, chemical, and biological properties of water are reviewed with the aim to understand the diverse role of the water molecule in conditioning and supporting life. The singular properties of water make it well suited for the development of carbon chemistry, helping sustain life in all of its myriad forms. Therefore, the properties of water span physics, chemistry, and biology, almost as if nature had intended for the three fields to coalesce into one. Everybody there? Yes. Uh, I kind of lost it as, as we were getting out here. Let me just yeah. let me just regain it. Can everybody see what I'm doing now, or no? No. Okay, I'll share it. Okay, now, can you see yeah. it? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so this video that I've shown is a 30 minute video, as you can see. It basically puts it in, in as I call the raster form, the information in vector form, which is here in this paper. So I urge you to review this paper because it's basically 90% what, what the video has said. We go from the graph, from the various water graphs, very extensive work that we have done with uh, one of our students four years ago, the story of the history of the water molecules and um, uh, the, the structure of the water molecules, which is very important in explaining its singular properties. And the regulation of temperature, very important because it, it has to do with the regulation of the weather. Uh, one thing I may mention to you, uh, we live here in San Diego, right? And San Diego has the ocean right next to it. But it does have uh, a very strong, I guess, geomorphological effect. And as you move inland, uh, the effect of the presence of the ocean is less and less important. And that is the reason why we have minimal temperature variability in coastal San Diego County. Well, if you go to El Cajon or Escondido, it will be much different and you'll have uh, hot weather where in fact that hot or hot or very hot weather where in fact that doesn't happen along the coast and that is one of the reasons why Proviso Ponce I live up in North County uh, actually Rancho Peñasquitos and I'm within five miles from the coast so 
weather here is very nice, but I wouldn't say the same thing if you go inland. I do apologize. I'm sorry many of you live inland and, ha and have to uh, suffer the weather during the summer here in San Diego. Okay, so we're moving in here to clear all this area, all this subject here. Uh, this is important, and here again it shows that the weather in, in uh, North Dakota is not influenced by the ocean. It's too far from the ocean, so it gets very cold and very warm. Likewise, the same thing, only we're going from state, from relatively uh, uh, over here next to San Diego, over to, uh, in, in, to extreme situations like that of North Dakota, which, which as you know, it gets very cold during the winter. Because of that, it, it does, it's not being helped by a proximity to the oceans. Floatability of ice, another thing extremely important, surface tension and capillarity, that makes possible life because uh, it is by capillarity that uh, water uh, moves through the plants and allows the transport of nutrients which the plants need. The nutrients are in the soil but they have to be moved from the soil to the plant. The plant is demanding the nutrients and they're moved by the water. And capillarity is instrumental in making sure that the water moves up the stem against gravity. Without capillarity, it, it wouldn't happen. Um, solvent property, water salts, transports just about every anything and everything. So that's also extremely important because he has to do it. Proton concentration, that is the very well-known uh, pH scale, which is very well-known. You learned that in, in high school chemistry. Uh, however, the other scale, which is a kind of a parallel or similar scale, is the PE, which relates to the electron concentration. That's not very well-known. It's known in, in microbiology, uh, but not so much in chemistry, uh, unfortunately. But that is the case. These two... Uh, form a pair. And the reason why I'm saying this is because since um, the issue or the subject of wetlands came important over the period of the last 30 years in the early 90s, uh, this issue of the PE or the, what is the redox potential of a wetland became important because the wetland, uh, the wetlands become, the water in the wetlands become much reduced in time. And therefore, we had to have a way of measuring the amount of reduction. And that is done with the PE scale, as shown in the video. This is a very important uh, graph that shows the time sequence of reductions, various kinds of reductions in a in new, newly flooded organic substrate, meaning wetlands. It's the, the easiest way of reducing material is oxygen reduction. That's the first one that happens. But after oxygen is exhausted, then the next step in the sequence is nitrate reduction, followed by manganese reduction, then iron reduction, finally sulfate reduction. This is, this is the time where things begin to smell bad because the, pre, the production after sulfate reduction, the production is sulfide, a hydrogen uh, sulfide, which as you guys know from your experience in in high school chemistry, it smells uh, like rotten eggs. So it's a pretty bad smell. And that typically is the smell in those things that we call, you know, stinky. And finally, after all these processes, uh, first oxygen, which is the vital, the vital one, then the next of the nitrate, manganese, iron, sulfate. Once these are gone, the uh, life has to continue, even though there is no oxygen and none, none of these others are there anymore. So what does uh, nature do? It takes the, the elements or the, from the structure. In other words, from, it takes the oxygen from the, by, through methanogenesis. The organic matter is, is processed through methanogenesis and the, with the production, the production of methane. So I have a good analogy in here, which I'm going to share with you today. At the beginning, when things are happening, there's it, like in a building that has the building itself and the furniture inside, right? That's my analogy. Uh, the first thing that happens is the oxygen. That's the food. 
the food uh, in the, your refrigerator. And after that, once the food's gone, you got to do something about it. You still have to eat. The uh, organisms have to eat. You start, perhaps you start selling the furniture because you don't, there's no food and you got to eat anyway. So you sell the furniture and the furniture in this case is the nitrate, manganese, iron, sulfate. By the time you get through with the furniture, the house is empty and all you're left with doing is to sell the house or break the house and sell it in parts, right? So that is a very good analogy about what, what is actually happening in nature. So with that, with that, I am finished over here. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to share with you um, uh, let's see, I'm going to share with you this letter to South American Explorer. First, let me show the video. This is an interesting story and has to do with the issue of volume versus discharge. Volume versus discharge. What? What's this? Vol everybody knows volume. A volume of water, any layperson would understand what a volume of water is. But they really can't, unless they're technically minded or engineers, particularly hydraulic engineers, they would not be able to relate to discharge. Because the discharge is the water that's being produced in time. The discharge is the amount of water, the volume of water going through a cross section. The cross section has to be determined for the discharge to be determined. So there's a difference between water and the volume of water and the discharge of water. And that is obviously very clear to all of you guys because you're all civil engineers. But it is not clear to people, to laypersons out there. And uh, I had an experience back in the early 90s of, uh, that I'm going to share to you right now about a gentleman who happened to be a geographer, a very noted geographer, world famous actually, who confused the two issues and said that there was a problem and that it was wrong. So the, what he had said or what somebody else had said in the magazine was wrong. So, so there was the issue there. So what I decided to do was to write a little short note explaining what the differences were between discharge of water and volume of water. So let's take a look at a video here. I call this video, it's a, it's a video on a short story that I told many years ago. I call it apples and oranges, and you'll see why. That's my argument with Lauren McIntyre. Let's start again. Can you see? Everybody can see it, right? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, thank you. Many years ago, I was, quote, accused, unquote, by the late Lauren McIntyre, the distinguished photographer and South American explorer, of throwing apples and oranges at him. The issue had to do with a statement he made in a specialty magazine that the Amazon River did not have one-fifth of the world's water, that this number was more like... That's what Lauren McIntyre said. It's not one-fifth, it is much less, but he was confused because the one-fifth relates to discharge, and he was talking about volume. Again, I make that quite difference between those two. One over 10,000. Being knowledgeable on the subject, I was eager to set the record straight and convince the editor of the magazine to publish a correction, hoping to shed light on the issue. And so I did, to compare the Amazon's annual supply of fresh water to the total amount of fresh water on Earth is one thing. I call this an apple. On the other hand, to compare the Amazon's annual supply of fresh water to the annual supply of fresh water that returns to the sea from the land, that is, the river runoff, is another thing. This I called an orange. McIntyre was referring to the apple, but when people talk about the Amazon's water, they are usually referring to the orange. In fact, my own calculations confirmed that the Amazon's runoff was about one-sixth of the world's total runoff. So now we are going to go, we're going to go to the, to the vector. 
Lauren McIntyre's claim about the flow of the Amazon amounts to the proverbial argument about comparing apples and oranges. He's basically comparing apples and oranges. Apple, to compare the Amazon's annual supply, supply of fresh water to the total amount of fresh water on Earth, including that held in that held by ice caps, glaciers, groundwater, lakes, soil moisture, atmosphere, biota, and rivers. Orange, to compare the Amazon's annual supply of fresh water to the world's annual supply of, of fresh water that returns to the sea from the land. And that can be done by a calculation. So we did that. McIntyre's quote of the article by La Riviere in Scientific American September 1989, in support of his statement that the Amazon contains less than one ten thousand of the total fresh water on Earth, is an apple. Somebody said that. It's a volume. The percentage volume is 0.01%. The same article states that the World Resources Institute estimates that, and here we go, this is a number which could vary a little bit, but that's the, uh, the, uh, the accepted by most people. 41,000 cubic kilometers of fresh water return annually to the sea from the land. The calculation of this figure is by looking at all the estuaries. Every estuary, by the way, has to be calculated. People do this uh, around the world. And then figuring out what the mean uh, water transport is and adding all that up. And that turns out to be 41,000 cubic kilometers returned annually to the sea from the land. UNESCO lists the, re the mean annual discharge of the Amazon at, at its mouth at 220,000 cubic meters per second. And that is based on a discharge of 157,000 measured at the Ovidos Narrows, which is where the Brazilian government measures the for normal situation, the flow of the Amazon. So this, you, we can do the calculation here, the hydraulics. This translates into 6,900 cubic kilometers return annually to the sea by the Amazon, which we estimate or we calculate that it is roughly one-sixth of the total volume of fresh water returning to the sea. So this we call an orange. Viewed in this light, there is no popular misconception to correct. So that's the, our story in regards to uh, uh, Lauren McIntyre. Interestingly about Lauren McIntyre is that he, um, for whatever reason, did a lot of travel in South America. And he, when he was young, that picture that's shown in there was, is when he was more or less middle-aged. But when he was young, he was out there stomping around, taking pictures. He was essentially a photographer, a travel photographer for all, for all, all that matters. And he uh, landed or discovered a very small lake that turned out to be the headwaters of the Amazon. And this is in the uh, department of Arequipa in southern Peru, uh, very close to what they call the Colca Canyon. And like I said, he discovered this lake. Subsequently, I did some research on Google Earth, trying to find out if exact if if this lake where does this lake uh, where was this lake? We can do that with Google Earth now. By the way, you couldn't do that at the time that McIntyre was doing his work 30 years ago. Uh, but we did find out that there is indeed McIntyre Lake out there, and I guess the the geographers and the, actually the Peruvian government have actually recognized uh, McIntyre by uh, naming that lake, which turns out to be the, the source of the Amazon River, meaning the farthest point where water is seen to run off the hills. There's a very high hill out there, and that is uh, the source of the Amazon. So interestingly, I urge those of you that are fascinated by discovery and geography and rivers in particularly, particularly as I am, to go out there, check it out, look for McIntyre Lake, or go looking for the source of the Amazon out there. Um, 
I have not received too many requests yet for the projects that you're going to work on, but there's a couple of those projects that are related to to rivers in the U.S. So I urge you to take a look at that. We should all be uh, studying rivers in one way, one way or the other, because that's that's our bread and butter. Uh, the rivers are, are the uh, elements that collect the water that rains, and we as engineers uh, look at the rivers to see how much water is out there that we could use because engineers basically our job is to figure out how much of the rubber of the water that runs in the rivers we could use and we're limited because some of it is need, needs to be left out there because you can't run the river dry we are also limited by the fact that we cannot take any of the plants needs because if we start drinking the water that the plants are taking, we're going to be left with our plants eventually. And that cannot happen. That is called environmental protection. So out of the 100% of precipitation of rain, about 30% is, is seen in, to run in the rivers, right? And that 30%, most people agree that we should leave 10% out there for the river to continue its own livelihood. So we're left at 20% only. And that 20%, we still have to consider nature and the plants. So let's assume ballpark uh, figure that it's that's a 10%. So basically we can count on 10% of the water. And that's of an average river because the river does, is, does not have an average, average runoff, then it will be much less than that. So you see what, what the world is up against. The population continues to increase at the rate of about, I don't know how much is it, uh, I think it's 1% or 1.5% per year. We're adding about 900, 90 million, 90 to 100 million. And right now the current world's population is turning, I believe this year it'll turn 8 billion, 8 billion people. And each one of them have to have some water, particularly if they are developed people like in Europe and in Asia, perhaps the United States, many countries in Peru, most of, I'm not Peru, Latin America, most of the countries in Latin America uh, have populations that of course need water. And where is that going to come from? We have a problem, a problem that would not be readily solved because it has to do with supply and demand. The supply gets to be shorter or smaller and smaller and the demand continues to increase. That is the challenge that we have as water engineers. So what I'm gonna do now is uh, we have 10 minutes. I'm going to start on the next subject, which is evaporation and evapotranspiration. Briefly, I'm just gonna introduce the subject and then leave, leave the main part for the next, uh, for the next uh, lecture. Over here. Evaporation and evapotranspiration. These are two processes. Evaporation in general is considered everything, but evapotranspiration is the evaporation that happens with the benefit of plants. And since it's important, uh, we have a tendency to calculate it separately. Uh, that now, we can do that now, but not in the past. When Penman was doing his work, which was in the year 1945 to 1948, Harold Penman, and I already talked about that, the, about the guy, the gentleman. He was doing the calculation for lakes. That was the job that he had at the time. And then eventually he realized that he now had to do the calculation for plants, meaning the evapotranspiration. And since he could not restart the whole project, he applied a factor which turned out to be, he said, about 80%. 80% of the evaporation in lakes was supposed to be the evaporation through plants. That, of course, was uh, an approximation, let's say, at the beginning of the development of the field. But subsequently, we have found out that that is not correct, and one would have to do the examination, the precise biochemical and phys physical chemical um, <clears throat> processes in evapotranspiration. The steps in the calculation of evaporation, evapotranspiration are very, uh, how can I say, uh, 
long and involved. The first thing or the first contributor we had was Dalton. I believe it was 1803 or about that time. He was a British gentleman who came up with the first idea, scientific idea, as to what evaporation is, 1803. Subsequently, nothing happened for about 150 years until Penman. Penman in 1948, I believe he has two papers, 45 and 48. So it's about 80 years, uh, 70 years from now. He came up with the Penman method. It was a conceptual method. What is conceptual? I don't believe I have talked about that because we consider that to be basic hydrology and we're not in basic hydrology. But let me repeat. Uh, there are four general approaches to hydrology problems. The first one is deterministic, meaning equations, physical equations. I guess you could say mechanistic, because we're talking about flows and chemistry and so forth. Chemistry, chem, physical chemical, okay, transport. The second one is stochastic. Stochastic is the field that uses probability. There is a constant, constant contrast, I guess, contrast between deterministic and stochastic approaches. If, a pro, if, a pro, if an approach is deterministic, it is not stochastic. Now, is the world stochastic or deterministic? That answer is a hard answer, but most people would agree that it has both aspects. It has, it should be deterministic, but sometimes we give up because of the complexity of the process and we end up resorting to, to probability or stochastic laws. Once we give up on either of them, of those two, then the, those two, then the third um, possibility comes about, and that's called conceptual. Among the preeminent conceptual models that we deal with in hydrology is the runoff curve number, the cell conservation service runoff curve number. That method was developed by Marcus. Vic Marcus in the year 1954. We're going to be talking extensively about the runoff curve number. And Marcus decided that he wasn't going to do physics because he felt it was too complex. He didn't, certainly at the time, I do not believe he knew anything about stochastics that was still being developed. So he developed the third method, the conceptual method. Turns out to be a very good method. And finally, the fourth method, which not too many people talk about because it is an old method. It's the empirical method, meaning I don't know anything. I'm just going to go do some measurements and come up with some parameters for the local situation. Suffice it to say that in 19, no, 1889, the rational method was developed in urban hydrology. And the method was called rational because people must have felt at the time that the method as they were using prior to 1889 were irrational, meaning empirical. And that was correct. All the methods for runoff hydrology, urban hydrology, that were done prior to 1889 were empirical. So, so as you can see, there's a hierarchy of methods. At the, at the bottom is empirical. Next level, conceptual. Some thought into the process, as Marcus did. He spent about 10 years putting this method together. Then you go kind of uh, on two sides. You can either go stochastic or deterministic. Obviously, in my opinion, the best way to do it is the deterministic. But that's uh, tempered by the fact that in not in all cases can you afford or can you do it because of the complexity, spatial and temporal complexity of what we are looking into. Precipitation is spatially and temporally complex. Runoff, the same. So at that point, if we do give up on the deterministic way, there's many other ways to do it. I don't want to talk too much about the empirical, but certainly conceptual modeling is also good and well accepted. And I'm going to talk extensively about that later on. So that's the difference between evaporation. And I did say that Penman came, came in in 1948, right? And then there was a gentleman in working out of Britain, I believe, in 1966. So 18 years later, he came up. His name was Monteith, and Monteith took the Penman method and made it physical. How does that happen? Well, I mean, we'll get into that. We'll talk about all the ins and outs of these two methods. First, the Penman method, and then the Monteith method. The Monteith method gave physical meaning 
to the Penman method. The Penman had intended it to be conceptual, but Penman did not know the whole story. When Thiet came up later and analyzed it and understood it in a better way and came up with the, I guess you could say, deterministic way of looking into the Penman method, which he called, well, not he called, it was later called as a penman dash Monteith method, penman Monteith. Subsequently, FAO, FAO stands for Food and Agriculture Organization, it's an entity of the United Nations, adopted the penman Monteith method as the standard method for evapotranspiration and evapotranspiration calculations around the world. So that is where we would stand up to this point. That was done maybe in the mid 70s or early 80s. Later on though, and I believe it was in 1985, there were some people working, I believe in uh, England, which improved the Penn and Monteith method. And that's called the Shuttleworth method. So we are going to be talking about those four methods. Let me name them. The Dalton method, 1803, the Penman method, 1948, the Penman Monteith method, 1966, and the Shuttleworth Wallace method, 1984 or 85. So that's the story about how we calculate evaporation. So um, at that point, uh, I'm going to continue with that topic this Wednesday. If there's no questions at this point, any questions at this point? Okay, well, if not, then I am going to stop it here and I'll see you Wednesday at 530 as usual.